Hi everyone again and uh, thank you for coming. Um, so as you know this is the online car showroom. For those of you that haven't been to a showroom before, I'm Hannah Baker and I'm one of the directors at Cambridge Architectural Research and CAR is a multidisciplinary company with researchers in energy, buildings and cities and risk. We also have practicing engineers. Today we have Eva Fulehan Reberg talking about net zero, zero carbon, zero net energy, net zero energy building, net zero greenhouse gas emissions and what do we actually mean by all of these terms. So Emily So is going to introduce her uh, after I finish this brief introduction as they met during their time in Cambridge researching for their PhDs. Um, Aoife will present for about 40 minutes and then we'll open up the, dis uh, the discussion for questions from you. Um, please bear in mind the presentation is being recorded. It might go onto YouTube afterwards uh, if you choose to ask a question and we're going to aim to wrap up at about 2 p.m. Um, so hope, helping with coordinating this today is Natcha, who's a PhD student in the architecture department at Cambridge. And at this point, I'd like to thank her and also Janet, another one of the CAR directors for organizing the invites for the show speakers and uh, our ever expanding audience. And thanks in advance, obviously, to Eva for her talk. So now, Emily, I'll pass over to you. Anna, thank you. Um, very well and welcome from me, um, everybody. My name is Emily So. I'm one of the directors at CAR and also a reader in architecture engineering at the Department of Architecture at the University of Cambridge. And as Hannah says, uh, Eva and I met when we were PhD students many years ago, and it's an absolute pleasure to have her back in the UK. She's uh, currently a professor in architecture at the Belfast School of Architecture and the Built Environment uh, at Ulster University. And she's also the director of the newly launched architectural research group and the lead of the new Zero Greenhouse Gases Emissions Building and Neighbourhood Group. And it's been a journey for her through kind of doing practice, working in uh, Hong Kong, Malaysia, the UK, the Bahamas, then decided to concentrate on research at the Department of Architecture. And I remember so well, for those of you who've been in the department, you know how short we are of space. And I remember we were both in the attic, you know, the little <laughs> PhD nook that we had. And she was educating me on um, certification um, in the hotel sector, which was a PhD subject, and really whether that was enough to reduce CO2 emissions and her passion and, and the, the kind of frustration of mm. us not doing enough really was, was the kind of starting point of our own education in terms of looking at um, net zero and energy emissions. And she's gone on to do wonderful things since the PhD um, at the university, Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim. Um, setting up and working with the research center for zero emissions buildings there, being involved with the national strategy of getting to net zero. And it's an absolute pleasure and privilege uh, to oh, introduce her. And really it's a bit of, it's gonna be a showstopper is what I was a showroom oh. showstopper. I will shut up there <laughs> because I know she's got lots to say and I'll, I'll meet you all again at the end of the talk. Oh. Eva, over to you. Thank you so much, Emily. I mean, we, many years have passed, but you know, it feels like it was just yesterday uh, that I was there and our trip to Bahamas, I'll never forget with Mina. <laughs> so as soon as this, uh, you know, the lockdown is finished, we will definitely get together. So Fabulous. I just want to say thank you so much for this uh, opportunity uh, to share, you know, the journey that I've been on with uh, my research since I left Cambridge. And um, it sort of feels like I've come circle <laughs> because I'm inadvertently still talking about certification in one way or the other. So, but it's really, really exciting. And, you know, I'm very honored uh, to follow in the footsteps and um, the humble footsteps of uh, Dean Hawks and Nick, Nick Baker, um, who gave the talk before me. So yes, large footsteps to follow in. So I'll just begin. So I just wanted to start off by giving you a little, um, you know, explaining what I'm going to talk about today. I really hope I can get through it. So I might need to skip some bits, but we'll see how it goes. But really, I just wanted to begin by uh, you know, why is this research important? Why are we looking at net zero? So I want to start by setting the context and the climate emergency that we find ourselves in. Um, and I just a very brief overview on current legislation and voluntary standards, just so that we understand the world that we're working in. 
And then I'll start to dive in a little bit into what do we mean by net nearly zero energy, zero emission, and all the different uh, definitions and typologies we are being confronted with as we speak. So as you can appreciate, I can't go into a lot of detail and it's merely just an overview. It's a signaling of uh, you know, the different approaches. And then I really want to sort of demonstrate um, and put a showcase, a highlight on Norway, uh, because as you know, um, I've worked there for 10 years. So I really want to showcase a sort of a national approach uh, and very much coordinated approach on a net zero definition, their methods and uh, an overview of some key design strategies. Um, again, I can't go into too much detail, but uh, enough to give you a flavor, I believe. And then really as an architect all along this process, I've really stopped. And after many years of you know, being quite a nerd in an Excel sheet doing calculation methodologies, I really sort of stepped back and was like, how are architects going to use this in practice? So more recently, I've been very interested in how do we bridge this gap between the research? How do we make it more accessible for practitioners and our own students, of course, who are the next generation? And then I'll end up with just a single slide, hopefully on reflections and next steps. So as everybody is aware, you know, we have a climate emergency, it's been declared, and what action collectively are we going to take? So a recent IPCC report stresses that we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 45% before 2030 and to reach net zero emission by 2050, if not before. So there's a clear warning that we need to act fast, fast and we need to act decisively. As everyone is familiar, you know, climate change is also associated with uh, global warming and associated sea level rise. But what we're seeing here is that these extreme weather effects are happening much sooner than we anticipated and climate change destruction is happening today. And even in my beloved Bahamas, you know, as you're all aware, there was the devastation caused by the hurricanes, which are happening more frequently and, you know, with more intensity. And as you're aware in New Orleans, you know, the hurricanes also um, resulted in tidal surge. Um, and even I spent a year actually doing a research sabbatical in the States and that year, I'll never forget, you know, what was it, 105 degrees Fahrenheit and wildfires right on your doorstep. So it really brought home to me that all of these climate change, uh, the destructive effects are happening now and they're touching all of us in different ways. So as a result of all of this, you know, um, countries around the world are um, declaring climate emergency declarations. Um, and what we're seeing is, uh, you know, firstly, I should just explain, uh, you know, what do we mean by climate emergency? So it's defined as a situation in which urgent action is required to reduce or hold climate change and avoid potential ir irreversible environmental damage. So the key message is that we need to reduce energy use and greenhouse gas emissions in the building sector. And this really needs to be an urgent priority to limit global warming to less than 1.5 degrees. So many of you, I mean, I'm talking to a room of experts here, but you know, building, uh, buildings account for um, 36% of global final energy consumption and almost 40% of energy related CO2 emissions. So improving the energy performance of the building stock and developing zero emission building concepts are really critical to avoid any increase in energy use and emissions. Much, I mean, you're all familiar in the, you know, of the European legislation that's in force now for nearly zero energy building. And this will really help to transition uh, zero carbon economies around Europe to uh, zero carbon. And um, key concepts would be, you know, very high energy performance and low energy uh, required to balance. And this should come from renewable sources. And this legislation is now in force. Um, so we really need to step up the gains and develop uh, national plans. 
So it's a really exciting time, you know, to come back to the UK because of all the countries that we reviewed, the UK is the first major economy to introduce a legislation for net, net zero emission, and this should be achieved by 2050. Um, and, you know, the need of addressing and reducing uh, life cycle emissions of the building towards such net zero ambitions is emphasized around the world. Like I was saying, we've got um, legislation in force now in the UK, but as well as that, there's a number of initiatives, really great initiatives that are happening worldwide. So as you can see in the box on the right, these are just sort of national approaches, voluntary standards um, that are in place. And on the left, you'll see Advancing Net Zero, which is um, a really terrific uh, project that is sort of coordinating. It's making a coordinated effort to reduce global greenhouse gas emission reductions. So they are hoping uh, to, not hoping, they will do, or um, set an ambition of 100% of buildings must operate at net zero carbon by 2050. So for their definition, they say it's a net zero carbon building is highly energy efficient with all the remaining energy coming from on-site or off-site removals. And what is really great about this initiative is you can go on the website. This is just a one pager I took from the website, but it's really clear in terms of infographics and um, I can't see on the right because I have all the faces of my colleagues here, but it's the sort of key principles. So I feel that's a really great step, uh, you know, for practitioners, uh, lay people to understand uh, pathways to zero. Again, I won't have time to go in, but I just want to say on the right hand side, each of the countries that are signed up to the UK GBC pathways, uh, advancing net zero, they have done these really nice uh, snapshots where they uh, will give you the definition. You can see the link at the bottom and sort of key strategies. So just uh, in the UK approach, the focus is on net zero carbon and I'll come into that later, what we mean by that. But in parallel to the UK GBC approach, um, there's this really nice uh, infographic one pager from Letty, which is the London Energy transformation initiative um, I haven't got to the bottom of how they're exactly linked but they're um, aligned with each other and again it's a really nice way to visually communicate uh, the definitions what are the targets and a sort of a stepwise approach to net zero um, for the operational carbon part in the US then you have uh, the LEED certification and that focused on they've developed let lead zero energy and more recently lead zero carbon again you can read more about this in their country snapshot i put the link on the bottom but as well as that it's really interesting there when we talk about communication to the wider audience they've um developed this arc platform which um should be available quite soon i believe so again it's trying to coordinate information and making it accessible to the wider audience but beware, <laughs> and I'm coming into the can of worms here. Um, obviously, the UK GBC approach is really terrific because it's uh, coordinating, let's say, uh, voluntary standards and certification approaches. But in many of the countries, what we see is there are parallel initiatives that may not always be aligned. So in the US, you have uh, the Department of Energy, which has um, a common definition for zero energy buildings. And I, I won't read it out in the top, but you can start to see uh, in the very top box, um, you've got net zero energy, NZE, and zero net energy. So you start to come into the sea of acronyms. But the main thing to point out in this approach is it's focused on a balance for the energy, the operational energy part. So here we are, where there's a lot of really terrific initiatives out there. Um, but because due to a lack of um, alignment, uh, but you know, I, I suspect this is happening because we're all rushing to the line very quickly and it's not always very easy to align things. But it's certainly um, resulting in a confusing plethora of various team terms rules and definitions 
which describe net zero energy and net zero emission approach. So this is where uh, our research began. So together with some colleagues in Annex 72, we decided uh, that we needed to really uh, do some research on this. And we started a survey, um, which I'll just move on to. Oh, is there a way that I can actually remove all the faces on the right? Um, no. <laughs> you should be have an option in your top right hand corner to have sort of speaker or gallery view that might help. Um, oh yeah, hiding thumbnails. So I can't see you now, but sorry. <laughs> So the objective of our research was really in response to this uh, confusing plethora that we find ourselves in. So the first objective was to provide an overview of the key parameters, boundaries, and performance targets mentioned in various schemes um, and standards worldwide. And the, how we selected them were we tried to select um, schemes that referred to either net zero energy or net zero emission for um, these different schemes around the world. Then the second objective was to provide detailed analysis of these terms, definitions, system boundaries, calculation methodology used to achieve the greenhouse gas um, balance. And then thirdly, we want to really come up with a proposal for an international systemized um, how do you say, and harmonized framework um, so that, you know, whether you're going for net zero energy or whether you're aiming for net zero emission, there was that flexibility within the framework. And also to just have agreement on calculation methodologies, et cetera, so that we could start to rule out misunderstandings and avoid greenwashing. So what we found was that we collected uh, 35 of these standards and schemes uh, worldwide. And we saw that the majority, 22 out of the 35, were actually focused on energy um, at the moment, let's say. So they were uh, standards that referred to either net zero energy or zero net energy um, standards. And then what we took um, was that we then wanted to focus in more detail about those standards that were trying to achieve a net zero balance for the whole life cycle. So including the embodied emissions for the materials and the emissions from operation. And um, so what we found, we had uh, 13 of those standards from 11 countries. And the other thing to point out was that the majority of all these standards worldwide are focused at building level still. So just some highlights, again, not having too much time to go into everything, but you can start to get a flavor of the different um, names, you know, the standard names that are used in different countries. I've just highlighted, for example, in Norway, we talk about net zero emission buildings. In the UK, um, we talk about net zero carbon. Um, so there are two different things which I shall go into. Um, what we also saw was that the building standards and schemes are based, we selected these 11 um, because they're focused on using greenhouse gas emissions as a metric. And um, so meaning kilogram of CO2 equivalent. And um, so whether you're talking about zero carbon or zero emission, we are using the same metric. So that's good. All of these um, initiatives uh, are all voluntary also, and they're mostly created and used by NGOs or research organizations. So together with, uh, my, uh, with Daniel and Daniel uh, Satola um, and Thomas and Maria, we've put together, this is just a snapshot of uh, the detailed research, but just so that we could try to highlight some key differences. So, in the left, I've chosen four of these, uh, the countries, you can see the, the difference in the definition. So for example, in Singapore, um, just to highlight that uh, scheme is focused on zero energy. So the metric that is used is on energy consumption. And that is similar to the US, you know, the Department of Energy definition I showed you, they talk about zero energy building and again, focused on energy. 
where is there um, there's a new development now for zero carbon buildings where they're starting to use the metric of greenhouse gas emissions for operation and embodied carbon. Um, in the UK, um, I also want to point out uh, that we've based this information from the UK GBC approach, and there are three levels uh, there. Um, I haven't highlighted it here just for simplicity, but it's a tiered ambition approach as well. Um, and they're currently developing uh, the embodied uh, to include the embodied and whole life cycle approach as well as operational balance. Um, I also just want to point out in Norway, we have a series of um, tiered ambition levels, which I'll go through when in the country highlight. Um, and also just to point out some key differences, Norway is the only one we found that is actually doing um, the balance across the lifetime of 60 years, whereas uh, in the US, UK so far, it's been on an annual basis. As I mentioned before, they're all voluntary, apart from the UK is introducing the net zero carbon legislation, which is very exciting. Um, I think I'll just leave it there. Um, I think that would be the most that I want to say on this for the moment. So what we, the key recommendations from this is that, um, you know, current voluntary and net zero emission building standards need to be integrated into national and local policy in order to really support the transition to a climate neutral or a zero carbon environment. And secondly, um, you know, international net zero carbon or emission building definitions need to provide some flexibility um, in terms of, you know, introducing tiered ambition levels, for example, because, you know, due to the diverse nature of building typologies, I mean, some buildings are listed, for example, so it's very hard to reach the same level of performance as, you know, for example, if you're working with a new build. So, and, um, you know, it's very important to include a tiered ambition level, but also to have uh, flexibility with the system boundaries that we're talking about, um, both in terms of energy, meaning on-site, off-site, exported. Um, it could be, you know, using certificates if need be, but we're not really advocating uh, the use of those to a large extent. Uh, but also in terms of uh, the life cycle approach, you know, sometimes maybe you're just wanting to use, uh, how do you say, cradle to gate emissions, or sometimes you want to include the whole life cycle um, right through to the end of life. Um, and thirdly, the international standard uh, framework definition that we're developing should allow for a variety of compensation solutions and not just focus on on-site renewable solutions. So I just want to say that uh, there's a lot more research currently being developed on this um, and there's a paper uh, developed by two colleagues of mine on net zero emission building and they're currently uh, developing a series of uh, different approaches so you can have like an absolute zero or a net zero emission approach, but I won't go into that uh, right here. So. I think that's all I really want to say. I have no idea how I'm doing time-wise, but um, I just want to move now on to uh, the Norwegian approach. So I've called this section Pathways to Zero Emission Buildings with a focus on Norway. So what's interesting in the approach uh, to Norway is that the funding for the research centers um, came from the Norwegian Research Council and the ambition was to create, uh, you know, net zero emission um, at a national level, um, actually by 2030. And um, so the time frame is a lot closer. And in order to achieve that, there was a very coordinated approach. So I don't know if you can read in my bottom left, um, but you can see. I think I can't even read it myself. It's so small, but. The um, zero emission uh, center, the Zen center, looking at buildings and neighborhoods, um, that is part of one of eight centers, which are all looking at different pathways to achieve net zero emission at the national level. 
So that allows these different centers to focus on one particular area. So the main goal of um, these centers is to contribute to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions nationally and internationally, as well as you know, providing a more effective use of energy and higher production of renewable energy. And also they allow um, you know, a, a center to be created to enable increased innovation and value creation in participating public institution and public businesses. So the main aim is really to bridge into the Norwegian society. So the vision of the Zen Center, so we're talking about neighborhood scale here, is to create sustainable neighborhoods with zero greenhouse gas emissions. So whether you're talking at building scale or neighborhood scale, the main concept considers greenhouse gas emissions in a life cycle perspective. So like I said, in Norway, we're talking about a 60 year life cycle. So this results in a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, energy efficient buildings, new local renewable energy production, reduction of materials and energy use and the use of environmentally friendly materials, as well as advocating the reuse of materials and solutions. So I just wanted to show you uh, this slide because even in terms of energy per square meter, so you start off with, let's say, a baseline um, consumption in Norway, uh, which previously was, let's say, 200 kilowatt hours per square meter. And then slowly a series of steps were taken. Uh, so Tech 10 is the building code that was introduced in 2010, and that helped to reduce, and um, you can see the energy consumption to just below 100, let's say. And then um, that was increased again in 2017 with the introduction, uh, the passive house standard. So that was uh, reducing it to almost half. And then 2020 is nearly zero energy, 2025 is zero energy and plus energy. So the green is really starting to show um, a balance between consumption, the yellow energy consumption and green production. So that could be from electricity, from PV generation. But what you start to see then is that the buildings will produce more energy than they use, and then they can start exporting that into uh, the grid, which is beneficial at a national scale. So what is a ZEV? So I tried to um, simplify this. So if you look in the bottom left, you see, for example, energy consumption in a building, right? Even if you're thinking about it in kilowatt hours, and then the green on the right is basically showing you electricity renewable production from PV. So where you get a balance between the demand and the supply, then you're essentially getting um, a balance at zero energy level. And when we talk about emissions, uh, you know, like a zero emission like at operation scale, what we're starting to do is we use a grid factor, which we apply. So that kilogram of CO2 per kilowatt hour, and we apply that to the operational emissions. Um, and where we get that balance then between demand and supply is what we call in Norway, the lowest ambition level, which is ZO. It means you've achieved a balance for operational emissions only. And then, like I said, you know, a key difference with um, a, an emission approach, a net zero emission approach, is you're taking a life cycle approach. So you start to include the embodied emissions from materials, which is shown in the blue part of the column. And so that can be all the embodied emissions associated with the materials that you use in the skin of the building. It could be the technical systems like the ducts. It can be the PV, for example. So you start to get a higher, let's say, footprint on the left side. So you need to obviously increase that balance with, um, it could be PV production, it could be uh, geothermal, it could be heat wells, for example. But where you would, for example, achieve a balance for the blue and the red part, then you achieve that second ambition level, which we call ZOM. So you're balancing all those emissions from operation and materials. Um, so 
So if you start to think of it in this uh, diagram as well, if you look at the green uh, circles, so that would be, for example, the avoided emissions from uh, PV photovoltaics. Um, so let's say that electricity generation is going to balance. You can see it's bigger than the orange circle below it, which is the operational demand of that building. But because we're also taking into account uh, the embodied emissions for the first phase, it's called materials here, but it's really you know the cradle to gate part, the production phase, where most the, of the embodied emissions happen. Then we have construction transport, the slightly smaller circle to the right of it. And then we have emissions from use, demolition, et cetera. So the green circle really needs to um, balance the total of all the orange circles below it. Um, and that way we're trying to achieve this balance over a lifetime of six years. So the emissions from renewable production must balance or compensate emissions, not only from um, operation, but also the life cycle of the building. So I said, just you're... as a dear 10 minute warning, so carry on, but yeah, that was your 10 minute warning. <laughs> I've only 10 minutes left. Yeah, if, but that's oh. okay. Oh. Carry on. It's fascinating. I just oh mentioned to warn you. So. <laughs> okay, so we've got these different ambition levels. Um, so you have operation, operation, material, uh, construction, and then end of life. So it's a series of these different ambition levels. And we also take into effect um, export and import to different countries because that really affects whether you can achieve a Z balance or not. So why is it important to consider embodied emissions? Well, the results from our pilot projects are showing us that as uh, the buildings are becoming more highly energy efficient, the orange, uh, they're achieving that through um, the use of materials that have a very high embodied um, carbon part, so the gray. So we see this ratio is somewhat like 60 to 40, 70 to 30. And um, so it's really saying that if we consider just the energy part, zero energy buildings, then we're really um, missing a large, a large part of the picture. So it's really reinforcing the need that we need to look at um, a life cycle approach. So, and also, you know, that uh, the results from all the pilots, just a snapshot here showing us that typically the highest embodied emissions are coming from PV as well as other materials like concrete, EPS, et cetera. But as a designer, you need to weigh up, okay, I understand certain materials are driving high emissions, but from an architectural perspective, what am I trying to, what is the goal of my design project? So from research to real buildings. So um, the Zeb Center was set up uh, and it ran for 10 years until 2017. It involved a lot of industry partners and it involved uh, the academic institutions and research institutions. But the main objective was to come up with competitive products and solutions for existing and new buildings that would lead to the market penetration of buildings with zero greenhouse gas emissions related to the production operation and um, demolition. So it also has been, uh, nine of the pilots have been built um, and it showcases, you know, strategies for different building typologies. So a lot of the research spans uh, many different um, packages. So dealing, starting with cru crucially the definition, the methodology, developing different components and prototypes and then realizing the built form. But essentially, you know, um, the main thing is there's a development of 10 steps to ZEB. Um, and essentially the main emphasis is put on the passive design approach. So good orientation and, you know, orientation form, trying to really uh, a careful choice of materials so that you really start to use that approach to reduce the energy and um, demand side. And then whatever uh, demand is left, then you're trying to balance that with a renewable source. So it's sort of an active system, let's say. So there's more about this in uh, the book, Zero Emission Buildings. Um, so you can read more about that. Um, 
Okay, I'll just show you this video really, it's like one minute. <laughs> so it just explains uh, the main concept of one of the um, bus house office A power buildings. Is an Norway. energy positive building that produces more energy than it uses. After 60 years, the building will offset the sum total of energy used in its construction, production of building materials, day-to-day -day running, and eventual demolition. This includes factoring in the energy consumption of all building materials used in Powerhouse. In fact, all building materials were carefully evaluated and selected based on how much energy was used to extract, manufacture, and transport them to the site. The sun is the source of energy production that is harvested by solar panels on the roof and facade. Powerhouse relies on the grid in winter, but compensates and exceeds this by generating far more energy than it consumes in summer. Much of this excess energy is distributed to neighboring buildings and infrastructure. During the lifespan of Powerhouse, it will have delivered a surplus of green and renewable energy to its surroundings. Okay. So, let's see. Can't seem to move forward. Oh. Yeah, so the pilot projects, um, they really offer an opportunity for uh, creating innovation hubs. Uh, they serve as living labs and lighthouse projects to learn and inspire knowledge on the Zen projects. So in terms of the Zen, uh, sorry, the Zeb pilots, like I said, there's a range of different typologies available. Um, they range in size from 100 meters squared for the Zeb living lab to you know, whole areas, uh, zero village, uh, Bergen, 80,000 square meters. So um, I have, I'm pretty sure I'm probably at the end of uh, my time. So I know that I probably won't get too much time to go through this, but I just wanted to showcase, you know, even with the Zeb House uh, Larvig, um, it's a really exciting project because um, essentially, you know, there was a great effort made, you know, in looking at the orientation um, and the form of the building. Um, it's a simple single family house. It's a wood construction and um, it's orientated sort of south, southwest um, as much as possible. Um, and it's used, the main thing, I'll just shoot forward to here, is that, you know, that the Orientation was very important. So the, the building was orientated, like I said, south, southwest. And um, the angle and the tilt of the roof was 19 degrees uh, to optimize for the PV. And um, just as a sort of a, a general approach to Z design, uh, this is typically one of the, or two of the approaches that are really important is this orientation and the angling. Um, and then when, because the, uh, you're trying to achieve a balance as much as possible, then we have the PV production on the roof where possible. Um, but as you can see in this case, then that would have resulted in the floor plan being very deep. So typically, again, a key approach would be the introduction of some type of uh, atrium to allow daylighting to start to bring natural light in to reduce the energy consumption. And um, like I said, majority in terms of material choices, typical approaches would be the use of timber. Um, and then uh, very, actually, it's almost about half a meter of rock wool insulation for the walls. Uh, so it results in quite an airtight solution. And um, so that's something potentially, you know, when we start to develop uh, solutions here in a more temperate climate, there could be more possibilities there uh, for natural ventilation, et cetera, to be integrated here. And um, so you can see in this project, there was a lot of initiatives and um, you had, uh, how would you say, the rainwater collection, you had uh, thermal mass. There was, uh, in terms of material choices, there was uh, the reuse of materials such as uh, brick. 
uh, was something that was very important and it gives a lot of character to the building and also wood. Um, typically, we see that a lot of the wood cladding, for example, is pine or spruce and using an old Japanese technique where you can burn the outside skin. Um, this helps to maintain uh, the longevity of the materials and reduce embodied emissions for that part. Um, so I just wanted to also point out, you know, that in the wall construction here and the thermal mass to the core of the building, there was an, an effort, obviously, to reduce embodied emissions for the concrete element. So the idea was explored to look at low carbon concrete and the reuse of bricks, um, which, as you can see, the aesthetic qualities are very um, beautiful here. Um, so again, you can see on the right diagram uh, that you have the red is the embodied emissions from the materials and you have emissions from operation, the green or the grey, and then um, you're trying to balance that with the, the emissions, avoided emissions from PV. Um, so you can see that the ZOM was achieved for this building. Um, and on the left, um, you can see a sort of a spread of embodied emissions for different uh, materials. And you can see again, the PV is the key cul culprit. Um, and how am I doing time-wise, Hannah? Because I'm probably not going You've to- You've got a it. couple of minutes. Uh, we've already got a question in the chat. So I think maybe if, yeah, yeah a couple more minutes and sort of wrap up. Yeah. Well, Instead of going into detail with this next pilot, um, I just wanted to point out that a key approach here, you can start to identify, you know, the orientation to the south, the tilting of the roof for PV. And an interesting thing that we found was that, um, you know, instead of thinking about, well, profiling the roof, actually, instead of a flat roof also saves um, emissions uh, because, you know, you can have building integrated PV or building adapted PV. So you actually, if it's integrated, for example, then you can save um, embodied emissions for the roofing material, for example. Uh, another interesting thing that we found out was that instead of having a concrete foundation, um, like a slab foundation, um, there was a three strip foundation. So that switch from you know, the slab foundation to the strip foundation, actually reduced, um, I think it was by almost a half, the quantity of concrete used. And you can imagine the associated uh, savings and embodied emissions was also really significant. So they're not um, rockets, or they're not hugely difficult uh, design uh, strategies to implement, but they actually had a big impact in saving emissions. So I think what I will do, I will just scoot through all of this um, and maybe just I could just very quickly mention if it's okay just about the yeah, Zen okay. that um, let's see so if you want to know more about the Z pilot projects please go to the website z.no and you can see all the publications and the pilot projects there with videos so that's really great um, but I just wanted to point out from 2017 onwards, um, the ZEB Centre ceased and the Zen Centre was introduced. And uh, so this is really exciting time because um, now we're shifting, we've got the same sort of multi um, multidisciplinary um, involvement of municipalities and manufacturers and practitioners, which is really exciting. Um, I won't go through this, but I just wanted to point out that the key difference here is that we now have more key performance indicators to consider. So instead of just energy and embodied emissions, obviously when you shift scale from building to neighborhood scale, then you need to consider a lot more of these uh, indicators, for example, spatial qualities, mobility, et cetera. So it's a real mix of not only scale, but also quantitative and qualitative issues. So this adds to the complexity in some ways, but there's also a huge pop, um, opportunity for savings at a larger scale, which I will probably need to end up with. But um, 
The Zen pilot, again, you can go onto the website. Uh, there's a number nine pilot projects that are uh, planned, very early phase planning at the moment. Um, this is just giving you a snapshot of the scale. So again, different typologies and uh, mixed use. And so this is a really wonderful way to showcase approaches at a larger scale. And yeah, I'll leave this in the presentation so you can have a look afterwards. Um, and yeah, you can go onto the website here and have a look at the pilots. So I just end up really quickly. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, possibilities um, and opportunities when you shift to neighborhood scale. Like I said before, um, it's not always very easy to achieve you know, a Z at a building scale, it could be because of the nature of the typology of the building. It might be a laboratory or a hospital which might have very high energy uh, demands, let's say. Um, or it could be that you're dealing with um, a lifted building. You can't really touch the skin of the building. So how do you achieve a Z? Well, if you then shift the thinking from building to neighborhood scale and start to think, of um, creating small neighborhoods even where you can create energy, energy synergies, then some buildings which lend themselves to more production or you could have some offsite production can be fed in and create a net zero approach at a neighborhood scale. So there's a lot of really wonderful opportunities there. Um, and, but of course, you know, with the opportunities that come, there are, challenges you know when we began this work there was um you know how you need to start with the basis again of what is the definition how do you start to calculate that for all these different kpis and um, which tools are you going to use when you're using multiple um uh you know assessment from multiple sources so and then you may have regulatory barriers uh, for energy ex exchange between end users so unfortunately, I haven't got time in this talk because I really wanted to showcase some of uh, like my own work, you know, but maybe there might be another time to talk about that because it's really important. How do we communicate? Can we create parametric and dynamic tools? And um, how do we integrate this Zen, Zeb and Zen thinking early in the design process? So I wanted to actually show you some examples from our own studio and previous work, but we'll leave that for now. I'll just see where I am with this. So I'll just go to my last slide. Where is it? Yeah, I don't know if you can read this. I just thought, well, I need to sort of reflect on, you know, all the possibilities that we have here. And um, you know, for example, you know, there's a really what strikes me coming uh, to the UK coming from Norway is that we really need to work with, um, you know, uh, developing a definition framework that has that flexibility for different design scenarios, whether that be a building or neighborhood scale. Um, and also when we're developing definitions, I mean, it's not just for use in the UK, it will be, you know, definitions that we can use in different climatic contexts. And how do we integrate future climate scenarios into those definitions? So the key really um, is about a framework that allows uh, flexibility. I'm thinking, you know, tiered approaches so that we allow again, the flexibility at different scales. And um, also the methodology is really key. And um, so, you know, how do we calculate where is the data coming from and having a sort of a consistent approach to this that is transparent across countries. And, um, you know, um, together with a new PhD researcher, uh, Ben, who's actually, um, his topic is going to be, you know, looking at the ZEB approach and looking at how that can be adapted for the uh, UK context. And um, so we've really been just starting, he only started a month ago, but looking at the UK situation and it's wonderful with the legislation and the tremendous initiatives with the UK GBC and Letty. And there's a lot of really terrific um, initiatives 
but it would be really great to have some uh, coordination and alignment between uh, the different initiatives so as at a national level that we can have a really common goal for achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Could this be some type of a center or is it a network, is it a group where we come together and we agree on a common definition, agree on the methodologies that really are, from my own experience in Norway, that was really key before even developing the concepts. What are we designing for? What is the goal? And then developing those concepts and moving on to pilot. Um, and obviously, you know, um, we, a lot of the work so far has been done focused on net zero greenhouse gas emissions, but it needs to be climate resilient as well as net zero. So I think having the, the two together is obviously going to be really crucial moving forward. And also, you know, developing international knowledge hubs, because a lot of the work so far has been done, you know, very high tech solutions uh, in, let's say, in Norway, cold, dry climates or in the, let's say, more developed context. But, you know, we need to reduce emissions at a global scale. And therefore, we need to develop, share this knowledge, but develop affordable and low tech solutions. So is the answer about creating sort of knowledge hubs around the world that could then we share and develop that knowledge, but then go have sort of springboards, springboards into local areas um, that we can then obviously design concepts that are more applicable to the local context. Um, another key thing I find just as an architect by training is that need for clear communication how we've a huge body of research, even if we stop today, we have a huge amount of um, knowledge gained, but how it just doesn't seem to be getting into practice in a very accessible way. I mean, even with my own students, um, God, <laughs> they're probably like, oh no, but even, you know, taking fifth year students and giving them these very research heavy reports and asking them to use their skills as architects to try to communicate key concepts in a way that's a lot more understandable than the language of architects is um, something we really need to focus on. So I'm really encouraged to see all the infographics and um, I see Mina and, and Renita have done these wonderful videos and that's really great. We need a lot more of the easy communication, but we know it's underpinned by um, robust uh, research. And, and like I was saying, you know, the tools that architects use, we need to make it easier for architects to really get feedback on, you know, their design impact of emissions at early design phase. And I have another PhD researcher who just started and we're looking at the use of, you know, user interface like dashboards and it could be uh, virtual reality so that it makes it much easier for non-experts uh, to get engaged in the design process. So I'll just end up here, you know, that, you know, let's not reinvent the wheel, let's share, get together, share knowledge, huge potential, I feel, for collaboration opportunities. We've got a wealth of knowledge in Zeb and Zen, and we also have the ongoing international work in Annex 72, and also the a huge amount of work that was done in the preceding Annex 57, where I was working together with Alice, who Hannah knows very well, and some other colleagues, Harpa and Tova, Freya. Um, but we had 88 uh, case studies uh, from around the world. And again, you know, we need to look for opportunities that we can really showcase and share this knowledge. So I will leave it there. So sorry, I haven't got to show you a lot of what I plan to, but. That was fantastic. We'll have to have a part two at some point to hear about <laughs> some of your own work because yeah, it's a pity that you haven't been able to present it. But I thought that was great and I really liked myself the table that you had with the definitions. I thought that summed up sort of how complex yeah. it is. Um, and then also I like the recommendations about sort of the flexibility in the policy. Yeah they're really good i think time is tight so we've got yeah. a couple of questions in the chat and mm. i will just ask both of those together and maybe you can sort of 
see if you can answer them at the same time. So the yeah. first one is from Ying Jin, and he says, first of all, great talk. And then his question is, um, in Norway, typically how much renewable energy that is generated by a building is actually used? And then given that the energy needs in winter are greater than in the summer, how do people there balance, or, um, how do people there balance with the needs with energy supply? And then the second question is from Nicola Terry, um, and that is, what is the counterfactual for the PV export emissions and um, sort of question, gas turbine or grid average? Um, so yeah. I don't know if you can sort of. Yeah, well, the those. first question, hang on, I can't actually see the questions, but um, <laughs> no, well, just from what you said. So with uh, Yin Yin's question, oh yeah, so, for example, in Norway, as he correctly picked up, I mean, in the summer, there's almost uh, 24 hours of um, daylight. In the winter, there's only about four. So how do you achieve a ZEB in those scenarios? So a key thing is the connection with the grid. So, and the use of batteries is another option. But technically, you know, in the winter time, when you don't have um, enough production, then you can either use a battery or you have other sources like combined heat and power, for example, you could have if I don't know in that video if it showed about the energy wells, because that's another sort of key design approach is the, the use of PV for the electricity generation and to point out in Norway, most all the heating is actually from electricity so that PV is really key. Um, and another source is the geo, the energy wells, so to get the heat from the ground as a free source of energy. So another approach, like I said, is uh, biogas is sometimes used, it's not so common, um, but there are other sources that help to balance. And in those periods of the year when there's a surplus, you know, of course, that is fed back into the grid. And when there isn't enough, then that is brought back in. But I don't know if I have an opportunity, but I only showed you one slide about this export and import of electricity. And I think, I don't know yet what the situation is in, England, in the UK, but in Norway, that was a really key factor for us because um, if you were to just use hydroelectricity, it's only 40 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, the emission factor for the grid mix. But research was done uh, by Sintef, which showed the export and import was not only across the Nordic countries, it actually fed down into Europe. Mm. Um, and in average Europe, it was like, let's say 500 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So it was quite high carbon. And then that high carbon was actually coming back into the country. So we realized that that was a really important part when we're calculating for Zeds because we need to take into account uh, this export and import mm. of electricity mm. because they are connected to the grid. They're not mm. autonomous ZEBs. Um, and the other point was that because the ZEBs are calculated over a 60 year lifetime, that's taking into account 60 years in the future. So we also had to consider how the decarbonization of the grid would be factored in. So both those elements of the export and import plus the future decarbonization of the grid meant that we decided to use dynamic emission factors to apply to the emissions for the operational part. And that is something I would say in the UK, I don't know yet how that's going to be handled, but it's just, again, sharing knowledge and experience. It could be something to learn from, be aware type of thing. And another um, interesting thing was with the uh, photovoltaics, again, you're talking about 60 years in the future. So the PV has a life, a reference study period of, let's say, I can't recall, 20, 30 years, let's say 20 years. Um, and then that would mean you would replace that three times in the 60 year lifetime. But when it comes to 20 years in the future, is it correct to, apply the same uh, factor, do you know, in 20 years time, because research is showing that the efficiency is 50% greater. So it's, again, we're now starting to question the need for dynamic factors where possible. 
um, for uh, some of the key materials. And yeah, there's a lot to talk about um, in that aspect. But again, it's just, do we need some sort of platform um, somewhere where we can have focused discussion on, you know, when it comes to developing definitions, these are the key things that we found are really affecting whether you achieve that balance or not. Mm -hmm. And I've totally forgotten what the other question was. <laughs> The other question was, uh, what is the counterfactual for the PV export emissions and then question gas, uh, gas turbine or grid average? Um, but just to double check on your time, because I realise it's yeah, you I that know. needs to I go, because um, we have had another question come in, but we can hold that back if you need to head off. Or do you have five, ten more minutes? Yes, yeah, I could have five, yeah. Okay, so the other question that we've got sort of new that has just come in is from Hugh Bent and that's and they have said a very interesting talk uh, and their question is how this powerhouse concept and future rollouts slash implementation can overcome a variety of barriers in the market, such as those currently widely exist to have prevented market from keeping on track with deep energy retrofit. Mm. Uh, so if you've got a comment on that, that would be... Well, I think, you know, the experience uh, from the Z pilots was <clears throat> that a lot of the uh, projects or the solutions, let's say, had to be market ready. So there mm. couldn't be any, that was like a very strong, um, how do you say, approach from the Z center was not to come up with solutions that couldn't be implemented in the market today. And also uh, cost is obviously you know a key aspect so really a lot of the test projects um, even in terms of emissions you know a number could be quite high but that's because they're demo projects you know and they're projects that you're wanting to sort of use as test beds and um, but in general the majority um, you know were very market accessible there was the skills available in the labor force to actually deliver those um, but what I find very interesting is, you know, um, well, we live in Bath, so, you know, and I'm actually, you know, we live in a 200 year old house here. And, you know, I'm really fascinated to think, how would you retrofit such a building when you have such, uh, you know, if it's a listed building, how do you go about that? But that's where I see a really strong potential for Zen because ours is like a, a terrace house, but it's part of a terrace of nine. So if you were to try to um, think of it more collectively with nine terraces together, could we try to start to develop um, solutions like that, not at an individual level, but just mm -hmm. trying to develop retrofit solutions that could sort of create net zero at small neighborhood cluster level. I think, mm. I don't know if that answers the question, but just also to point out, um, you know, this whole thing of learning from other countries, it's always completely different when mm. you're moving that concept to a different context, mm. because mm. what we found, I didn't get to show you, but with the students in Belfast, it was like, how do you, they're grappling with coming up with um, net zero, uh, neighborhood concept in and around the campus and you know one of the key things we ran into was that the concept in Norway is all about an open society and creating energy synergies but one of the first barriers that comes to light in Belfast is there's a lot of division between different communities which mm -hmm. is quite historical so therefore how do you overcome those sort of um how do you say challenges that are sort of cultural and political. Can you take a concept from a different cultural context and then apply it in a new context? Um, but my thinking there is that you just see the concept as is. It's a concept, but the solution will be very different because of you know, the situation you find yourself in. So even architecturally, um, you take the concept of the net zero balance in Norway, but for example, in the UK with more temperate climate, maybe there's more opportunity for introducing natural ventilation. There could be different renewables like wind instead of maybe all PV. And, um, you know, so you will, it's, 
I think just taking the concept and starting to explore the architectural response is very interesting as well. So. That's good. I could literally listen all day because I mean, <laughs> as, you, as you know, we'll so keep on doing for for, yeah, for, for the next what, uh, few hours. Yeah. I love what you're talking about, Costa Rica, as you mentioned, Alice is my PhD supervisor, so conversations that we've had in the past as well. So yeah, so all really interesting. But I promise that Emily is going to sort of have the last word in the response. Yeah. So I, also I always have to have it. the last word. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <I'll hand> <laughs> No, I mean, I, I echo what Hannah saying. You're going to have to come back if you've got too many slides, interesting things to tell us. There has to be a part two. But I mean, in terms of the things you've been showing us, it's fascinating. And that's this feedback of research and design and actually having that practical experience and the, the yeah. actual making things work, you know, as, as a building a neighborhood scale is so important because theory can tell you one thing, the surveys can tell you another. Exactly. But actually having that feedback and actually informing how you then approach uh, the next piece of research is really yeah. key and it's been really a fascinating talk and I I really am so glad you're back in the UK and that we can we can tap into your your wealth experience but also hopefully work together in the future you know, Absolutely. The, we have I many years ahead of collaborations between the departments and with CAR ahead yeah. and it just leads me to say thank you so much we yeah. will see a lot more of each other I hope um, yeah. and we'll keep learning from you Aoife oh. thank you thank <laughs> you again <laughs> And okay, thank you. And thank oh, sorry, you go, Aoife. I was just letting it round up and thank the audience for listening. But yes, <laughs> but yeah, you go. It's so um, no, thank you so much for the opportunity. And you know, it would be wonderful, you know, in real life, <laughs> so we can actually see who we're talking to. So we'll make sure that happens when, yeah. when we when we can. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Thanks again, <laughs> and thank you, everyone else. Bye. Bye. Bye.